Okay, we move for the next talk from um, Jesse Stryker. Uh, he's a postdoctoral associate with the Maryland Center for Fundamental Physics, working on the interface of quantum field theory and quantum computing. And he completed his PhD in 2020 at the University of Washington in Seattle, where he was advised by David P. Ka Kaplan. Jesse's study have considered various aspects of near and far-term quantum simulation of lattice gauge theories, most notably how to deal with local gauge constraints. And before going to Seattle, Jesse got his du uh, dual um, bachelor in physics and mathematics with a minor in Italian language from Arizona State University. So thanks for, uh, for your talk, Jesse, in advance, and looking forward to hearing from you. We can hear you. We can see your slides, but we can hear you. Can you hear us? Uh, yeah, just okay, a second. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, perfect, yeah. Now we see Thank everything. you so much for the invitation and for the introduction, Alba. All right, so I'll be talking today about SU2 gauge theory on digital quantum computers. Uh, this is a simulation that I worked on last year with Natalie Klo and Martin Savage. And you can find more about it in this publication. So I like to start off with what is the physics motivation for doing something like this? Uh, something that we would like to do in uh, nuclear physics is simulate quantum chromodynamics uh, processes such as hadronization in order to get a microscopic understanding of nuclear interactions. We'd like to map the complete phase diagram from QCD uh, from first principles, including deriving the equation of state for nuclear matter. <clears throat> and so if somebody wants to do these things, then the, uh, how does one do that? <clears throat> well, these are non-perturbative problems in general. And so this leads one to have to numerically simulate uh, QCD degrees of freedom. Ordinarily, this is done by way of lattice field theory uh, for simulating QCD. Traditionally, what this looks like is space-time is discretized with the lattice, square, cubic, or hypercubic, depending on the dimension that you're in. Uh, you'll have matter particles, like your quarks that live on sites, and your gauge bosons, like the gluons of QCD living on the oriented links that join sites. Uh, the gauge fields are associated with some Lie group, as opposed to the Lie algebra, ordinarily. Uh, and so these are group valued variables that live on the links. <clears throat> so for example, if we were in an SU2 gauge theory, uh, this link here uh, with the link operator designated by U uh, takes eigenvalues, which are themselves matrices from the group SU2. And what you do with these is you form the Wilson gauge action from the entire collection of gauge variables across the entire lattice. Uh, first, you have to take them and form a gauge invariant op object, which is known as a plaquette operator. Uh, that's formed by multiplying uh, these oriented link operators going around every elementary uh, uh, square in the lattice, and then taking the trace at the end. And then you add the adjoint for uh, Hermitian theory. Um, right, so then the exponential of this Wilson gauge action acts like a probability weight for the configuration, uh, at which point you can now do Monte Carlo on this. Uh, the fermions were integrated out in an earlier step, and I'm sort of simplifying it a bit just for sake of brevity. Uh, and if somebody wants to simulate real-time dynamics or non-zero baryon density, unfortunately, these problems have uh, complex actions, and they therefore suffer from sign problems. So if you have problems of this sort on the classical side, uh, that leads us to ask whether or not quantum computers will allow us to solve them or make progress on them. I'm specifically going to be considering digital quantum computers, uh, which is a little bit newer in its application to lattice gauge theories today. And here the paradigm is you prepare some initial state uh, psi i, you act on it with some series of gates, which amounts to some large unitary transformation, and you get some final state out on which you're going to do your measurements. And so if what you want to do is simulate a gauge theory, then you want these unitary gates to be like the time evolution operator uh, with the Hamiltonian that you're interested in. And 
So this leads you to have to study uh, Hamiltonian lattice gauge theory. And there is no complex action that we have to deal with right off the bat. So there's no apparent sign problems, although that's not proven per se. And so the general problem that we're faced with is how do we map the Hilbert space of our gauge theory and it's the time evolution by its Hamiltonian onto qubits and the gates acting on those qubits. So the remainder of the talk, I'm gonna uh, introduce Hamiltonian SU2 lattice gauge theory uh, as an example of a non-abelian lattice gauge theory. Uh, I'll introduce the particular geometry that we looked at in order to uh, do a concrete simulation. Uh, I'll explain the mapping to qubits and summarize the results that we got by simulating on I the IBM Tokyo chip. And finally, comment on possible generalizations in future directions. So in Hamiltonian lattice gauge theory, these link variables that are classically uh, just matrices living on the links, of course, they get promoted to operators. So these are matrices of operators now. Uh, the form of gauge transformations is the same way that it is on the classical side. Uh, link operators get transformed on either end by some different matrices within the gauge group. Uh, you get some omega n on one side and then it's adjoint on the other uh, in an SU group. Since you have these two kinds of gauge rotations, you have left and right electric fields that uh, act to generate those independent rotations or quasi-independent rotations. Uh, the uh, commutator algebra that's obeyed by these electric fields and the link uh, variables is shown here, uh, where your electric fields on either the left-hand side or the right-hand side each individually obey the uh, Lie algebra of the group. So in this case, the FABC would be the Levi-Civita symbol. Uh, and then the commutation relations that the left and right electric fields have with the link operator in order to produce these objects like the omega or the omega dagger uh, results in these relations where TA are the generators of the group uh, in the representation that the link operator is in. So these would be the poly matrices uh, divided by two for SU2. So these left and right electric fields have colored components as well as their spatial components. And if you were in quantum chromodynamics, you'd have eight of those color components. Oh, right. And uh, the Hamiltonian is formed by the gauge invariant Casimir, uh, which results from contracting the electric fields with their color indices. Uh, and then the magnetic Hamiltonian has the same form that, the, that was seen in the Wilson action uh, as before, except for now we only have spatial plaquettes. So what is the Hilbert space that all of these operators act on? Well, just looking at one link for now, uh, these link operators are diagonalized by states which are parameterized by elements of the group. Uh, where the link operator acting on some group element state is has eigenvalue, which is a Wigner D matrix uh, associated with that group element and the components of the link operator. This is a coordinate-like basis on the manifold of SE2. Uh, there's also a momentum-like basis for the conjugate electric field variables. Uh, these are labeled by some uh, irreducible representation, some angular momentum of SU2. Of course, this isn't a true angular momentum. It's just a, that's just the name for the representations. Uh, and then there are quantum numbers associated with a complete set of commuting observables on a link. Uh, in this case, you can diagonalize, say the three component of the left electric field and the right electric field on each side. Okay, that should actually be an R. Um, and so you get one quantum number from each side associated with those uh, three components. And their eigenvalue relations are just uh, J3 eigenvalue relations. <clears throat> and then there's a eigenvalue relation obeyed by the Js uh, where the quadratic Casimir formed on the left or the right hand side uh, is identical and they take the values J times J plus one. Now the 
Hilbert space of the entire lattice will be the tensor product of all of these, except for that's subject to Gauss law constraints, uh, which takes the form of a covariant divergence of the electric field of being equal to the charge density, uh, where this is a covariant divergence. And you have color components for this uh, equation. Uh, these are Gauss law generators, so Gauss law has the Gauss law has color components. Uh, the relation between the two bases that were given above is uh, given by a generalized Fourier transform, uh, which uh, is facilitated by the Wigner D matrices along with appropriate normalization factors uh, like the dimension of uh, representation up here. And due to the fact that we have these constraints at every site of the lattice, uh, we have a very small corner of Hilbert space or a collection of basis states, which is actually allowable by gauge invariance uh, compared to the entire full space of states that's available from just the naive tensor product of all of the links. So what would it look like in practice uh, to use this basis that I just introduced and which is most conventional for Hamiltonian lattice gauge theory? Well, the first thing that you notice is that the truncation is awkward if you want to use uh, two state systems or qubits. Uh, if you have all of these J, M, M prime states and you truncate the theory so that it's fi finite by going up to only some maximum angular momentum J and each individual angular momentum has uh, this many states, 2J plus one squared, then you can add up all the states going up to your cutoff capital J and you'll find that the dimension of your truncated link Hilbert space is uh, given by this expression that's cubic in J, uh, which is not some power of two. So you're gonna have some extra states around that you're gonna have to uh, exclude by hand in the simulation. Worse yet, you have non-commuting constraints. I mentioned that the Gauss law operators have uh, color components and they obey a Lie algebra. And by virtue of the fact that they obey and algebra, which uh, and their commutators aren't just zero. Uh, this means that they don't commute. And so you uh, don't have, you can't choose a basis which simultaneously diagonalizes all of your constraints. Moreover, we just know from the solutions of the constraints that there are many more degrees of freedom being carried around by using this basis than are actually necessary to simulate the physics. So to make progress on this, uh, in a concrete way and a simulable way, uh, we had to choose some system. And so what we went with is a periodic string of plaquettes or some this uh, plaquette ladder geometry. This is in a sense one dimensional because it can only be extended in one dimension arbitrarily far, uh, but it has, <clears throat> uh, pure, it has three point vertices where angular momentum flux can split. And so you can actually have non-trivial dynamics. Um, the length can be arbitrary, so you can take some large volume limit. Uh, and also important is the fact that we have three point vertices. And it turns out that there's a unique singlet combination uh, that's available per uh, vertex for any given triplet of J's. So it turns out that we can use this geometry and its three-point vertices and just solve the constraints uh, in closed form analytically and construct a gauge singlet basis. So first you specify some collection of angular momenta on the uh, links of the ladder. And then once you've given names to the angular momenta all over there, then you can write down some gauge invariant state, which is a function of those. Uh, this is a busy looking expression, but it's really only doing a couple simple things. Uh, here you have the ket that's encoding uh, all of the quantum numbers surrounding, say, some particular, uh, or all the quantum numbers going around the ladder. But then you have prefactors, which are given by Klepsch Gordons, and their role is to form uh, gauge singlets at the top vertices and the bottom vertices of every one of these. Uh, so-called staples. 
So all we're doing is uh, using angular momentum addition to form singlets. <clears throat> so we can compute the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian if we just know what the action of the plaquette operator is, and that is itself composed of the link operators. Uh, when this acts on one of the representation states, then it results in two possible states that come out uh, due to the fact that the link operator, its action is like adding a half unit of angular momentum. And so if you're starting at some angular momentum j, then you can get uh, j minus a half or j plus a half. Uh, and this cartoon here is showing the fact that the action of a, a plaquette operator on the ladder, uh, it has coefficients which are dependent on the angular momenta neighboring that plaquette because you need to know those coefficients and your klebsch gordon coefficients, but then it will act by changing the angular momentum on the links that are a part of a plaquette. And so this is everything we need. So once we've got this uh, singlet basis and uh, the matrix elements of the plaquette operator, uh, it turns out that we still have disallowed states. Uh, and this is a result of the triangle inequality. You could pick any collection of angular momentum you want on the ladder. But of course, if you're looking at some three point vertex, not all possible combinations of angular momentum surrounding a vertex can actually add up to angular momentum zero. Um, but we use this as a freedom in defining what our plaquette operator is going to mean by constructing a gauge variant completion of it, by which we mean we're going to construct a plaquette operator, uh, which is only designed to get the right matrix elements between the allowed states, and we don't care what its action is going to be on the disallowed states, or we're really just going to set it to zero. For a specific truncation of the theory, we pick a half unit of angular momentum. Uh, so this will allow each link to essentially be a qubit with this mapping to the computational basis here. Uh, <clears throat> and then it turns out that there is an additional symmetry in the ladder when you have such a low uh, truncation level. Um, and so you can write down the uh, matrix elements of the plaquette operator. <clears throat> uh, in terms of these quantum numbers here. Uh, so th then if you stare at this, then you can find that the plaquette operator is equivalent to this expression when you express it in terms of uh, operators acting on the qubits, where all of these coefficients are just coming off from this table, and appropriate projection operators are being inserted uh, corresponding to the quantum numbers in the states here. <clears throat> For a specific uh, volume, then we take the length just to be two. Uh, this is the smallest non-trivial geometry that we can get. Uh, so, so along with the simplifications that, that the symmetry of this tiny system has, uh, it turns out that there's only four active links. These bottom two links are equal in angular momentum to the top two links. Uh, so going back to the plaquette operator from the previous slide, we had projection operators onto uh, angular momenta on the left and right hand side of a plaquette. But now that we've got such a small volume with periodic boundary conditions, uh, we've got identification of this link with what would be over here. And these projection operators are not uh, in harmony. So these ones just get removed and we only have these two terms. So the resulting gauge variant completion of the plaquette operator just takes this uh, simple form here. It's uh, uh, just two terms with projection operators on one of the qubits. Uh, and then you've got bit flips acting around the plaquette that you're looking at. <clears throat> So then to simulate this, we use Trotter-Suzuki time evolution, uh, where our time evolution operator is approximated by separating out the electric propagator and the magnetic propagator, which for this system has two terms 
one from each plaquette. And so what we try to do is simulate for some time t spread out either over one trotter step, two trotter steps, or however many we can get away with, starting from the strong coupling vacuum state that has vanishing angular momentum everywhere. Well, using the formula that uh, was shown a couple slides ago, uh, the direct circuit that you can write down to associate with uh, the time evolution operator of that is given by these controlled gates, uh, which, and then this circuit can be converted into this one in terms of these concrete angles and controlled knots, Z rotations and Hadamards. <clears throat> And in this case, we were able to uh, exactly decompose uh, the circuit into uh, gates that can be programmed to the IBM quantum computer. Uh, so this doesn't introduce further systematic errors uh, at the algorithmic level. <clears throat> and so trotterization respects gauge constraints importantly. Out of IBM, what we get are probabilities measured in the computational basis. Uh, so the first thing that we do with these is we do an inversion process where we try to get what the pre-measurement probabilities uh, should have been out of the device. This is because there are measurement errors associated with uh, reading out the state. Uh, so by doing measurement errors on uh, prepared states that we know the initial states, then we can learn what the statistics are of getting bit flips on the various uh, bits of the chip and and subsequently try to invert those probabilities. Another step that we can take is we can do a controlled knot noise extrapolation where wherever we have some controlled knot in the simulation, we can replace that uh, formally by three controlled knots. Uh, since the additional two are the same thing as the identity operation theoretically, but in practice, these have noise associated with them. And so they'll produce additional control not noise. Okay, thank you. Um, and so then what we can do is try to extrapolate our pre-measurement probabilities back down to zero control not noise. And so what do we get out of this? Well, the first and most important thing to look at is how well do our states even stay in the physical subspaces? Uh, the purple plots here are uh, shown for one trotter step, where the dark purple uh, just has the regular C naught uh, circuit, and then the light purple here has the superfluous controlled knots inserted. Uh, and you see that when you have more controlled knots in the circuit, the probability of staying in the physical subspace uh, drops down substantially. Uh, the dotted line here is indicating the probability of being in the physical subspace by just choosing a completely random state from the Hilbert space. Uh, but when we extrapolate that back through the um, from the ordinary circuit, then we can get to probabilities that are now in the 0.6 range. So this still doesn't keep us completely in the physical subspace, uh, but it does give us something that we can work with. Uh, in contrast to two trotter steps where with our two controlled knots, we still had uh, probabilities that essentially over or which uh, intersected through each other and uh, were in the neighborhood of this just randomly chosen state probability. So we were not able to do that fine of a, a time evolution. So what this means is the errors were partially mitigated for one trotter step, but for greater than one, the uh, trotter step and our mitigation protocols that we considered, the results aren't reliable enough. As a test observable, we looked at the plaquettes or the electric energy surrounding a plaquette as a function of time. Uh, so the purple dots here are showing uh, what we got for one trotter step uh, with <clears throat> the blue showing the two trotter steps. Um, and the continuous line here represents what the analytic result should be in uh, the uh, delta t going to zero limit. While the dashed lines here show what we would expect analytically for finite trotter step size. So we actually see that for one trotter step in our error mitigation procedures that 
uh, our extrapolation was able to get an agreement with what we should have what we would expect uh, analytically for that trotter step size, but that was not the case for two trotter steps. Our extrapolated pro, uh, uh, distributions and the electric energy we got from them is well away from what we'd expect analytically. Uh, so this is a success for the for the one trotter step we claim. So to summarize those results, uh, that's the first simulation of a highly truncated SU2 system uh, done, which was done on existing IBM hardware, used gauge theory constraints and uh, NISC era appropriate uh, protocols to mitigate at least some subset of theirs, uh, the most obvious ones that could be fixed. And for low enough circuit depth, because number of trotter steps corresponds to the depth of the circuit, uh, we were able to extract an observable successfully. So there are lots of possible generalizations of this and uh, future directions that could be pursued. Of course, one would want to go to a higher cutoff. It turns out that all of the links are active now. Uh, the symmetry that was available is no longer, uh, it no longer allows you to set the top and bottom links equal to each other. Uh, your gauge variant completed completion. Oh. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> your gauge variant completion is going to have more matrix elements to reproduce. Uh, we would also like to go to higher dimensions where three point vertices aren't as naturally there. And even though we saw that they were very helpful for us in this geometry, so uh, that may present important complications. Um, this will all involve more qubits, more gates, and more noise. So maybe this isn't possible today, but hopefully soon. And then, of course, the dream would be QCD, which is SU3. And we hope that perhaps uh, these Schwinger boson formulated theories or uh, loop string hadron formulation uh, that I've worked on with Indrakshi or Chattery might be helpful here. And I thank you for your attention. Thanks, Jesse. Very interesting talk. Um, I don't see any questions at the moment. I think we have time for a couple of quick questions. I actually have one. So in general, uh, quantum field theories are formalized in uh, Lagrangian formalism. So I wonder how do you obtain the Hamiltonian of, uh, for instance, Swinger model, as Christine mentioned before, and also you, or the SU3, uh, for instance, a QCD Hamiltonian. Do you know that? Yeah, so the Koget Susskind the Hamiltonian is sort of the classic or conventional Hamiltonian that you use in uh, lattice gauge theory. And this is something which can be derived by sort of reverse engineering the path integral. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a quantum field theory with the path integral, at least uh, with these gauge theories that, that you mentioned, then you can construct uh, on-site <clears throat> base, or sorry, on-link bases and sort of insert your copies of the identity matrix in appropriate places and then extract out operators uh, and find a transfer matrix. And then that gets you to a Hamiltonian, but then it also has to be subjected to a uh, Gauss law constraints. So, and that can be applied uh, even for, for theories that are not the Singer model too, like uh, QCD or? That's right, okay. yeah. But I wouldn't say all theories, but uh, at least for these ones that we're interested in. OK, nice. Um, I don't see more questions. Uh, I'm also, we are also out of time, uh, to be honest. So maybe we can close the officially the QRST seminar here, and we can just stay a little bit longer to discuss more things. So thank you, everyone. Yeah. And thank you for the speakers for, for your talks. Uh, everything will be updated in YouTube. And, and yeah, thanks again for for coming to this seminar. Yeah. Thank you very much.